Uh, let me once again also say that I'm delighted to be here uh, in Singapore. I'm delighted for various reasons, uh, not least that I, I used to be uh, working here in Singapore with Deutsche Bank uh, 12 years ago and uh, left in uh, 2003. And uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to a city which is committed to change, committed to progress, conscious, and uh, has a large number of uh, people like yourselves who clearly do want to not merely tune into the winds of change, but actually to be part of them. And I think, therefore, three, three cheers to the audience and to the SMU for hosting us. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the coalition which has been launched right here in, in Singapore, the Teep for Business Coalition, and uh, also talk to you about externalities. But let me begin with completing a story that Peter Backer very kindly began for me about Rio. Because uh, as I went into Rio, uh, Peter, um, I had scaled down my expectations. I was concerned about exactly what you described, and so I narrowed my, my view. And this is an old slide that I used at a lecture at Yale University where I used to teach at that time. Um, basically, the students had asked me to comment on what was my one key uh, expectation, what was my, my wish for Rio. And I focused that uh, lecture on exactly this, on natural capital. So I said that, look, we are in a complex space of human capital, social capital, natural capital, and physical and financial capital. And all we are measuring is the financial capital or the physical capital side. And whether it's at the level of the company or whether it's the level of the country, we are using a very archaic and old-fashioned instrument called the Mariner's Compass, whereas in fact what we should have is something more like a spaceship's dashboard of instruments to measure our complex pathway through this difficult space of many capitals. And uh, in that sense, therefore, when I came out of Rio, and, and this was, I guess, partly my reduced expectations, I was actually delighted that my one uh, dream for Rio was, uh, was being achieved because we had any number of uh, supporters come together, and as, as Peter has also pointed out, it clearly was a time when business realized that it had to take over uh, the solving of problems and not merely asking governments to please do something about it. Um, so we, of course, had the, the uh, World Bank uh, and uh, Conservation International and uh, the UK government and several others, and they're all represented here, thank you, taking forward the idea of waves and accounting for natural capital. A declaration was formed. There was something famously called paragraph 47, which is one of the 283 paragraphs of the Rio Declaration, The Future We Want. Well, I'll reserve comments because I don't have much to say about, much that is kind to say about most of the other paragraphs. Because um, a, a small story, my daughter who was there in Rio with me um, also read these paragraphs. She's also in, in a related space and she decided to start writing tweets on those paragraphs. And some of those tweets are really quite amusing. They basically say nothing. Um, unfortunately, that was most of the declaration, but paragraph 47 actually does say what needs to be said in a conservative kind of way, that yes, corporations should start measuring and reflecting and accounting for their externalities. And that's really the topic of today's speech. But what are externalities? Let me first explain this to you very quickly by saying that this is the whole problem behind sustainability. As Akim Steiner reminded us in his comments, two-thirds of the economy is private sector. Two-thirds of GDP, two-thirds of employment come from the private sector. And yet, if we target corporations on merely the creation of financial profit for shareholders, we target them too narrowly because they are huge engines, huge engines which create impacts on human capital. They actually create human capital. When you join a good company which trains you well, you leave with a earnings profile which is higher than the earnings profile that you came in with. So that's positive externality. When you typically work for a company, you are making use of energy, probably fossil fuel energy, negative externality. You may be an extractive business, once again, mispriced, negative externality. You may be a business that is making use of land because it's in agriculture or, or in mining or whatever, and not accounting for the costs of lost forests and lost wet wetlands, negative externalities. So the thing that differentiates the externalities from what you do for a business is that what you do for a business is basically creating private assets in order to be sold, in order to get cash in for your shareholders. The surplus is your shareholders. But at the same time, you're doing 100 other things, and you're not accounting for them. You're measuring only a sliver of your actual impact on society. It's not OK anymore to measure a sliver of what you are. It's not OK to be just focused on the small bit that the rules 
and, and the, the accountants at present tell you to measure. And that's really what this is about. Try to make corporations, as it were, have 360 degree appraisals. It's no longer okay for most managers in most companies to simply be very nice and very respectful of their one boss and appear to be performing well and get great ratings and to be dreadful with their customers, horrible with their colleagues, and actually not serving the purpose of the business other than in the eyes of their appraising manager, you do 360 degree appraisals. So think of it this way. What we are talking about today is a 360 degree appraisal of the corporation beyond just the one thing that the shareholder is interested in because that's what they, they've created you for. And this whole space is about private profits and public losses and I illustrate with an example from Thailand. This is an actual set of studies done in 2000 and 2007 by Ed Barbier, Professor Barbier, who is also one of the advisory board members of TEEB. And the results of the study were that the driver, the economic driver for the conversion of mangrove swamps in South Thailand into shrimp farms was economic. If you converted one hectare into a shrimp farm, instead of being worth something like $600 worth of fuel wood for the local community, you could get $9,500 worth of profits for the shrimp farmers. Well, that's value addition, but is it? Because part of the profits, those $9,600, were actually subsidies. When you subtract the subsidies, the comparison of fuel wood for the, for the local villagers versus uh, profits for the shrimp farmer are not that big. But is that the full story? No, you need to look further. Because what happened when you converted the mangrove was that you effectively created a system, shrimp farming, which through salt deposition and chemical deposition actually destroys the land. So that after six, seven years, you actually cannot even do shrimp farming. And you need to spend public money to restore it to its original quality if you want to do anything. And on top of that, removing the mangroves means that you have actually removed the one means that the village had of protecting itself against the storms and cyclones and surges that increase with intensity as climate changes. Account for that, and those also can be valued. So now you have it. The real comparison is cost once you've accounted for the $12,000 worth of storm protection that's being provided and accounted for the cost of restoring the shrimp farm to productivity is not plus nine versus uh, 0 0.6, but is actually minus 11 versus plus 12. The lens with which you look at any change in economic activity, in other words, the so-called trade-off choice that you're looking at, shrimp farm, mangroves, that lens makes a difference to the answer in the trade-off. If you look at the lens purely of private profits, you get one answer. If you look at the lens of total public wealth, you get a completely different answer. Economics is the currency of policy, and I think Akim was referring to that in his speech. And unless we get our economics right, we will not get our policies right, and that is exactly what was happening here in Thailand. Thankfully, that has stopped. Together with Vietnam, they have started restoring mangroves, and I think things are moving in the right direction. But that's, once again, one small success story. How does that matter? What about the rest of the world? A study was done by TrueCost, a research firm in the UK and in the US, which calculated the total externalities, the total cost to third parties of doing business as usual, of the top 3,000 companies around the world. And that cost was huge. We were talking about something like $2.15 trillion for the top 3,000 companies. That's about 3.5% of global GDP in one year. So that's a significant cost. And which companies and which sectors? Well, largely it was energy, it was, it was manufacturing, uh, it was food production, and uh, it was construction. And these are not surprising because you use energy, emissions are caused as a result of using fossil fuels, and that has a cost. Lord Stern and his team calculated those costs. You use fresh water, extract it normally for free from the ground, or you get it subsidized from uh, a national supply. That's a cost. Someone has, to pay, someone has to pay for it. Someone has to earn less as a result of it. We worked out, in the TEAB study that has been referred to, we worked out a few examples of how entire sectors could calculate their externalities or their third-party costs. And the one that is interesting was from China. Uh, many of you would know that in 1997, the Yellow River went dry. Thousands of villages along the length of the river, for nine months of the year it went dry, had to suffer the costs of loss of productivity and, and poverty. Literally the year after, the Yangtze River flooded. Again, lives were lost, over 5,000 lives, and many villages lost, lost their livelihoods. What was happening? What was happening was a total mismanaged of, mismanagement of ecosystems. Upstream water supply was in flux. When the, when the rains came, there were no forests left to hold that water and release it slowly into these rivers. So you'd get a gush of flood. And when 
it stopped raining, then there was basically no water. It had gone. So this kind of cycle of floods and droughts is a natural consequence of mismanagement of upstream afforestation. And of course, the government of China understood this, and they put in a ban on deforestation in 1998 in China. Ironically, if you look at the numbers out here, if you add up all of these um, externalities, the actual costs of them is something like one and a half times what was the price of timber in China. So if, for a second, you think that if these externalities, so-called, could have been internalized, in other words, if they had been reflected in the price of wood in the Beijing marketplace, then wood would have been two and a half times the price that it was, because all of that, the, the, the actual price and the externalities would have to be added in. And where was this benefit going right now? Well, most of this construction timber was being used in prefabs, which was exported. Exported to Europe, to USA, to Japan, to Korea, and to Hong Kong. Right? So that's where the benefits were, because timber in prefabs, prefabricated material for housing construction, was being made available cheaply. That's where the benefits were. And where were the costs? The costs were to the society in China, to people in China, to poor villagers who would suffer because of floods or droughts or the loss of river transportation or the loss of agricultural productivity. Typical example of externalities. And that's, that's the challenge. How do we bring this out in the open? Because it's not only about China construction it's, it's, or, or forests. It's about all aspects of business. And I think our measurement systems really have to change. And that's really what is driving, largely, the, the T for Business Coalition. So here's uh, a vision, a mission, and a strategy which has been discussed by the, uh, by the board of, of the T Business Coalition. And we want a sustainable planet. Why would you not want that? Why would you want an economy which is not a green economy, which delivers well-being, which delivers poverty reduction, and does so without creating ecological scarcities and environmental risks? Everyone wants a green economy. The problem is we don't have one. We live in a brown economy, the exact opposite. So that is the vision. Natural capital has to be respected for that. It has to be valued. Mostly, it is invisible. It is the economic invisibility of nature that is one of the main reasons why it is lost. We use nature, of course, all the time for everything, whether it's bee-based pollination or nutrient and freshwater flows from the farms, uh, from the forests to the, to the aquifers to the farms, or for ecotourism, or, or for all forms of livelihood, including fisheries, in, uh, in, uh, for small fisher folk. We use nature because she's valuable. We lose nature because she's free. That's the challenge that we have to address, the economic invisibility of nature. Our mission is, of course, changing the rules of business. There's no point talking about a change in economic direction and resource use if we don't talk about what needs to be done by the corporation. We are two-thirds of the economy. Some, in, sorry, that's a global average, but in the US, it is 75% of gross value added GVA and it's 83% of jobs. So this is how significant the private sector is as part of the world. We are the single most important institution of our times, the corporation. If we don't change the corporation and the way it operates, and the rules of the game is really what it's about, then we are not gonna achieve any change. And the strategy is let's start measuring because what you do not measure, you cannot manage. So here's how the whole thing done, it gets done, and I use cement as merely an example. The production of cement happens around the world. China is the largest producer, but of course, in China, there are companies which are global majors which are producing cement. If you actually look at cement, it's a hugely complex process. This is the typical factory floor map of cement. But you can distill that down by measuring the impacts in terms of the energy inputs, in terms of the particulate emissions and the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and then you can work out the externalities. Typically, a ton of cement creates one ton of carbon dioxide and it creates other, other impacts as well. And these have all been done. These have been done thanks to the good efforts of the Cement Bureau, CEM Bureau as it's called, making use of advice from the World Business Council, from the GRI, and applying it to their, to their members. But of course, what's missing here is how do you convert this into equivalent dollars? How much is the health cost of the uh, pollution, the winter smog? How much is the agricultural cost and the productivity cost of eutrophication? How much is the global cost of climate change? Cement at three megatons uh, per annum is 6% of total global emissions. How much is the economic cost of that? We should know because the Stern Review gives us some sense of the answers. And so this is how we are gonna move forward. We have to go sector by sector. We have to engage the leaders in the sector. We have to engage the public associations. And that is why the process of the T Business Coalition is indeed an international and complex process. 
there's a lot of work which has already been done discovering the so-called externalities, which tend to be because of emissions, fresh water, loss of forests, pollution, waste, and so on. And there are all kinds of institutions already involved with us and who have been the progenitors of, of such analysis, such as the World Business Council, who was formed uh, here today, the GRI, which is represented here by its president, uh, in the Corporate Eco Forum, the Carbon Disclosure Project, the Water Disclosure Project, and so many others. Then comes the coalition, which is going to work on the economics of these so that we can translate these quantities into numbers with which we can address policymakers and businesses themselves. And finally, together with these impacts of of corporations on natural capital, we have to start thinking about their impacts on social and human capital and bringing that into the reporting framework. And that's really the work of the IIRC, uh, the International Integrated Reporting Committee, of which, once again, Herman is, is a board member and so is Peter. So there's a lot of work. There are many institutions involved. Global collaboration of this kind is not often seen. But unless we have global collaboration of this kind, we will not get success. That is my firm belief. And that is why when I look at the ownership map, if you like, the board membership of the Team Business Coalition, it's literally a who's who, but that is the way forward, ladies and gentlemen. We are at a time where, as Peter has pointed out, it is really 2020 that we should be worrying about. Economic direction and resource use, the direction has to change now in the next eight years rather than over the next 2050 because that's the time when hopefully the rest of the economy follows. That leadership that is needed has to be provided now, and that's why we need that many people. So the work that's been done is basically threefold. We are working on three studies right now. We are working on a theory of change just to make sure that people are comfortable why we are focused on this. Uh, we are working on a map, a kind of global map of who's doing what where so that the global collaboration can work very well. Uh, the office here is headed by Dorothy Maxwell. Dorothy, where are you? Yeah. The lady up front out here, so you'll see more of her as time goes on. And uh, we are trying to pull this together based in Singapore on a global basis. And the third study, which has already started to deliver some results, is one which is about trying to identify which are the sectors, which countries, which locations, and which businesses we need to look at where the big costs are, whether it's to climate change or to freshwater extraction or to emissions and waste. And just to give you one example, if we look at coal power generation in the US, the total environmental cost of that is $337 billion. That's, that's the first cut estimate that we've got, which, by the way, is one and a half times the actual value added of that sector. So it's generating more cost than it's generating value addition as a sector. And uh, this is a point that I have picked up in my book as well, so I, I kind of believe that number because I've seen it from a different angle. And this gives you an idea as to why this is important. How sustainable is the coal-fired power electricity sector in the USA, or for that matter, any of the others, whose ratios are sometimes even worse? A, these numbers are very big, ladies and gentlemen. They are part of the 2.15 trillion that we talked about. And B, this cannot go on. You know, this game of musical chairs or this, this free lunch that we are enjoying at the cost of nature is basically not viable because what we don't see is that we are providing the free lunch. We are paying for it already. And you can't keep doing that. Resources run out, risks accelerate. Good news is on hand because this approach, this method has been tested out. Puma's results have already come out and I think more will follow. There's a coalition being formed. You will hear from uh, the head of Puma in a moment. Um, and I just want to say that I'm confident that if we persist and we pursue this direction, we can achieve change in the next eight years. The role of the coalition is significant. Your collaboration, especially as companies based in Singapore, to provide some of the critical mass that is needed for each of these sectors, whether you're in the power sector or, or in, in uh, fast-moving consumer goods or whether you are, you are in construction, doesn't matter. Dorothy is here. Please approach her. Please ask her what you can do. And I can assure you, for each of you who is interested, there is a role to play. Thank you very much indeed.